Hello. Hello. Welcome to a flat pack history of Sweden, episode eight. Yeah, it is time for even more ironing. Yep, because we like ironing. Um, we like the Iron Age. Yeah, we like it so much that it became two episodes. We didn't think originally that it, it would be, but when we had recorded this, uh, it turned out we had so much material that uh, we thought we'd better split it into two. Yeah, which can't be too bad. Gives us more time to prepare for the Vikings as well. Definitely, and gives us time to uh, present a lot more interesting things about this period in Swedish history. But before we continue with the Iron Age, uh, should we do the Swedish phrase of the week? Yes, of course. So this week's phrase is Lega nes i blöt. Yeah, Lega nes i blöt, which literally means to put your nose somewhere wet. Interesting. Yeah, so it means to care about things that's not your business. I suppose in English we also talk about the nose. We say stick your nose in it when we mean, you know, you're taking an interest in something that you've got nothing to do with. And can that be sort of sneaky? Yeah, I suppose it can, like trying to find out stuff that you're not meant to be finding out. Cool. So you can say, uh, Mamma ska alltid lägga näsan i blöt när jag ska göra någonting, which means, oh, mum always sticks her nose in things when I've got plans. It's, uh... No centered, both yeah. in Swedish and in English. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that one. Well, we are going to stick our nose not somewhere wet, but in the Iron Age. All over the Iron Age. All of our noses are all over the Iron Age. Last week, we talked about the pre Roman Iron Age, where everything went a bit Neolithic again, <laughs> I guess, and skipped some of the progress that went on during the Bronze Age. But then we sort of brought it back to a more continual development of Sweden with the Roman Iron Age, with lots more contacts with the outside world again, continuing with trade and just generally putting the finishing touches to the foundations of what would be the exciting developments in the rest of the Iron Age and the Viking Age beyond. Yeah, and uh, this week it's time to finish the whole thing off with what's usually considered the Third Iron Age period. Germanic Iron Age, Migration and Vendal Periods. We found a really good quote which sums up the Migration and Vendal Periods from Brian Nordstrom's History of Sweden book. So would you like to read it? As yeah. I yeah. The Migration and Vendal Periods were times of great wealth, artistic creativity, change in cult and burial practices, and violence. The graves, hoards, and treasure finds, remains of literally hundreds of fortifications, and a record of abandoned villages and farming sites reflect these characteristics. Many sections of art, society, and politics in these periods may also be seen as direct precursors to the Viking Age. End quote. So they're basically baby Vikings. Yay, baby like, Vikings. Like baby Yoda, but baby Vikings. Yeah, aww. So it certainly does sound like that's the case. And that's because this time of the migration and Vendal periods coincides with the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West and the huge movements of barbarian peoples around Europe, which rewrote the map considerably. Um, but this definitely didn't mean the end of trade or cultural development. The Roman Empire flourished in the East for another thousand years, and the development of the Frankish state in the West and the cultural richness of Iron Age Ireland are just two examples of the ongoing wealth in the West of Europe, which Swedes were absolutely eager to continue engaging with. Trade only increased in importance at this time, especially on those islands of Erland and Gotland and in the Lake Melloran area. One place in particular was a trade and production site on an island called Helga in Lake Melloran. There's a settlement there from around 400 to 800 CE, so right at this time, and excavations show that it was perhaps the centre of iron production for Sweden, and the manufacture of intricate jewellery and other items took place here, and it was a real hub of commerce. Oh. It was the place to be if you're a Swedish metal worker. And also trade 
because some of the stuff found here, again, it's a bit like the Ulaburan shipwreck. They had casting moulds, gold Roman coins, a bishop staff from Celtic origin, and even a small bronze Buddha from India. Wow. All of that had made its way to an island here or in Lake Merlaren. Which is, yeah, I want to know how that Buddha got there. <laughs> Boat building also reached a high point, uh, laying the foundation for some of those amazing Viking adventures we are going to see in the near future. And the knowledge certainly wasn't lost during the pre-Roman Iron Age. Yeah, people were still making boats. Yeah. Political change also started to take shape in this period with some evidence of the first Swedish state looking thing centered in Uppland and extending into Östergötland and perhaps beyond sort of slowly emerging but this will become again much clearer in later periods and for once this isn't in the south of Sweden yeah. that those areas are quite far north in terms of what we've been talking about so far yeah, in the podcast true so that shows you that this is the first period as well where these the best people are not just in the very, very south. They're spreading around because all those chieftains from the last episode in the Bronze Age, they were really far south. Mm. So even though you'd like to think that the south is still the best regardless. This, yeah, I was thinking of how to phrase that the best people are always in the south. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Uppland and Östergötland and sort of central mid-Sweden. Yeah. And as you would hope, there's lots of physical evidence for these political changes as well, because you can see this in the literally hundreds of circular hill forts that are popping up all over the place, a bit like what's going on in um, Roman Britain or pre-Roman Britain. They would have been the centres of power for the power-hungry would-be royals or top dogs in society who are trying to assert their control over the population or the production centres. If you had that amazing trade center near you you would want some way to take mm. some of the money in taxes or do something to take control of it so that's one reason why they would have built these hill forts and all this is linked to evidence sometimes sketchy of an emerging monarchy that would may have been based on this iron production itself the vendor and migration periods of the germanic iron age are known in the art world as the age of gold mm. because nordic artisans produced masses of gold items ranging from rings and bracelets to clasps and decorating their weapons most of this gold probably came from the eastern roman empire which was melted down and then turned into something that the locals wanted themselves but there was also a lot of gold coming in from the collapse of the roman empire in the west as Roman towns and cities were plundered and these barbarians decided to go back home because their army doesn't exist anymore and all of this sort of stuff. Yeah. They're bringing all these goods to Sweden. And because of all this wealth, people had to keep it safe. Yeah, you've got all this cool gold stuff. You want to be sure it's kept safe. We see the beginning of hoarding when people had to bury their goods before battle or any kind of drama not knowing if they'd live to get it back. And the fact that there were so many hill forts show you that there was certainly violence back home in Sweden, as well as in the service of Mediterranean and European warlords. Yeah, and all of that stuff is great for us now because loads of those people who did bury their all their gold in a field didn't come home from the battle and they're left for farmers in the 1750s to dig up and take home with them yeah indeed and finally where would we be without rock art or this time it's actually more like stone art yeah we talked a lot about rock art in the bronze age episode but now we're back for some more yeah and now the carvings on rocks from before have turned into huge stone slabs being set up and carved on with detailed pictures of axes and serpents, armed men, and of course the favourite imagery of them all, boats. Uh, I'm sure we'll have time to focus more on this as we reach the Viking Age, as this is really when these stone slabs with carvings on them get really quite impressive. Yeah, we'll save the rock art, I think, for a special episode in the Viking period and we'll talk about the Iron Age origins because it's kind of a bit disappointing 
to just talk about a little bit now before it gets really good later. So Yeah, we'll do all of it at once. Now, as we have briefly mentioned, until the Germanic and Vendel period, there is definitely a lack of sources. There is a fair amount from the Roman Iron Age, but a lot of it is not natively produced in Sweden. They are items brought in from abroad. All good to show the extent of the trade and connections at the time, but perhaps not much evidence for the work of the Swedes themselves. So it is true that this period is sometimes called the Age of No Finds by Swedish historians and archaeologists. Historians speculate that it might be because conditions were harsher in this period. Personally, I also wonder if it suffers as a period in history from being what came just before this incredibly popular and much researched Viking Age. So, you know, people skip this to get to the good stuff. That's a good way of saying it, really, because it can't be easy being the Iron Age. It's a bit like being a warm-up to an incredibly famous band and nobody wants to listen to you. Yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, the Iron Age is the bicycling monkeys that opened for the Beatles. Okay. That's a reference for anyone who's watched Friends. Which I haven't, so I don't get that. No, <laughs> but uh, more for you. But we do have some cool evidence that we should not really talk about, but just say that they exist and you could maybe have a look mm. on the internet and have a look at them. So there's loads of gold necklaces. There's the Myrna Collar from the Germanic Iron Age. That's from Vestergotland. And a five-tiered necklace from Feriestad on Erland. They are super cool. So you could probably Google them. The Myrna Collar is just M-O-N-E if you don't have the Swedish characters. M-O-N-E Collar. And also we have from this period, a find that's not from Sweden, but still very interesting. It's the Tollund man from Denmark. Now, the Tollund man is a naturally mummified corpse of a man who lived uh, in the 4th century. Uh, he was found in 1950, preserved as a bog body in Jutland in Denmark. It's actually quite scary how lifelike he looks after these thousands of years. Yes, it's pretty grim. Apparently, when he was found, the people thought he might be like a recent murder victim, not a body from the Iron Age, because he was so well preserved in the bog. Do try and find a picture of him. Yeah. Um, Tolland, T-O-L-L-U-N-D. Now, th these are my favourite things. There's stone and turf labyrinths um, or mazes that yeah. you would have in like English country houses mm -hmm. or in the park or something. So they're just like the mazes that you go in, in a child as a child, but they're made out of stone mm -hmm. and they're not head height or anything. They're just marked on the ground. And there's loads of these from the later Iron Age. Yeah. Talking of stone carvings, um, one particular example, there's a really cool one of a snake witch type mm -hmm. thing on Gotland. Yeah. And also on Gotland, there's a place called Loistar Hall, which is 30 meters long, 16 meters wide, and it's sort of like a big triangle shaped Iron Age hall. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a find, it's a reconstruction in the 1930s, where like a lot of this stuff was going on in the 30s. They excavated it and they've now remade it. And it's partly made out of this weird swamp sawgrass, which is apparently a plant from the area. Um, and we got a little picture here. So do you want to yeah. say what it looks like? I mean, I it looks like if you've ever seen thatched roof cottages from Northern Europe, but the thatched roof goes all the way to the ground. It's like it's all roof in a, in a V shape like that. It's like a, a grassy tent. Almost. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. A massive grassy tent. Yeah, so it's quite, it's quite cool. Now, something that happened during the Iron Age, we mentioned it briefly, and I'm personally quite excited about it, is that Sweden gets its first mention in written sources from abroad. People finally noticed it. Yay! Our existence is acknowledged. But to be fair, it's fairly vague. Like, when Sweden gets its first mention in written sources, it's a bit generic and weird, and there's definitely no use of the word Sweden yet. No, that's quite far in the future, mm -hmm. and like you're saying, in these first sources, 
you don't really know if the people are talking about a real place or it's somewhere like Narnia <laughs> or if they're just passing on stories. Yeah. It's, it's all really weird. Definitely. These... Early mentions are in sources left by Roman and Greek traders and scholars. Most of them, if in fact not all of them, had never been anywhere near Sweden or Scandinavia. I mean, why leave the sunny Mediterranean to go explore some far off cold place? Uh, but, you know, it's, it's nicer to rely on secondhand sources. So there's quite a few. There's Herodotus, the Greek oral historian, who's sometimes referred to as the father of history. He talks about a land beyond the kingdom of Skeeta, where the winter lasts for eight months and where the summers are cold. It does sound like Sweden, I guess. Yeah, that could be Sweden. And there's also Pythias, another Greek, who introduced the term Thula, which many have interpreted as the Nordic region or Scandinavia in general. Yeah, similarly, Virgilius, who's an old favourite of mine, also used the term Thule or Ultima Thule, meaning the land furthest away, uh, which I quite like as a term. If you've ever been to rural northern Sweden like I was recently, you you can certainly feel what he mean. It is a land far away. Unfortunately, both Thule and Ultima Thule has later been used and is still used nowadays in like far right extremist propaganda, uh, which is a sad sign of the use or rather misuse of history for nationalistic and extremist uh, purposes. Yeah, you see that a lot in, I think, all countries have particular aspects of history that certain groups like to claim. But something completely different. I'm surprised to hear you say that Virgilius is an old favourite. I yours. mean, are you kidding me? I'm a big Virgilius fan ever since his role in the Divine Comedy. Uh, Brackets joke. <laughs> right, it's a joke. I'm not sure how this will fly. Uh, yeah, no, like, Virgilius is the guy who guides Dante through, uh, through the circles of hell. Anyway, the area that's today Sweden gets more mentions during this period. You have Tacitus and his De Germania. This is the very first mention of potential Swedish forebears, the Suonis, which I talked about in the very first yeah. episode. I got you to guess and you said Stephen Fry <laughs> um, would have been the first person who wrote about Sweden. Uh, but no, it was Tacitus. <laughs> There's also Procopius. He talked about a group of migratory people who lived in the general area of southern Sweden and Denmark, again, without naming them. Yeah, I mean, they're not that important, it seemed like. No. It seemed like they didn't care. It's just vaguely, there are some people living in this random area. Yeah, but perhaps the most accurate, if we can call it accurate, was Jordanes, and he wrote about the Great Migration Period and called an area Scanza, mm. and he said that it was a place that was a hive of races or a womb of nations. And then he talks about that there's over 20 tribes in the area and they mm. all get together and do stuff. And so that was probably maybe Scandinavia. Yeah. Um, and as much as we do love this stuff, we will be talking a lot about it in a special episode we'll do, talking about the gap between this time and the Viking Age and touch on the sagas, how a lot of this stuff is sort of second, third, fourth hand, not fake stories, but not really mm. grounded in particularly much evidence. So we can talk about how it's not necessarily history yeah. per se. It's sort of indicative of what might be happening, but not like in 20 AD, this yeah. bloke did this and did that. It's more vague in general. We'll have a special episode on the sort of where the Venn diagram between history and myth, where they meet, but more on that later. Speaking of writing in general, the runic script, most known as the, sort of the writing of the Vikings, was developed in the second century CE. And the brief inscriptions that remain from this time demonstrate that the people of South Scandinavia spoke a proto-Norse, which was a language which directs ancestor to modern Swedish. Oh, yeah, this is the time when we get the good old runor, the rune writing, something that all Swedish kids learned about in middle school. Would you like to cast your mind back, see what you can remember 
yeah. basic rune script. Yeah, so maybe audio isn't the best format to do this, but we'll put a picture on Facebook and Twitter so that you can refer to something visually as well. So to put it simply, runes are letters forming an alphabet, just like the letters in the Latin alphabet that we use in English or the letters used in the Cyrillic alphabet or you know whatever writing you refer to. They are symbols in a written language. That's the key. In fact, they are the oldest evidence of a written language in Swedish. But the language used at this time was quite different from modern Swedish mm-hmm. in many ways. And to the fact that if some bloke was transported into the modern day and started speaking his old rune type language, people pretty much probably wouldn't be able to get what he was saying. Yeah, and similarly, as someone who reads and writes in modern Swedish, I can't just all of a sudden switch and write something in rune or yeah. even though that would be cool. We'll return to runer when we get to the Vikings, because that's when we get these famous rune stones, these big stones with lengthy inscriptions on them. Uh, but we actually start getting writing with Runer before that. Yeah, you don't just go from nothing to these huge sort of like car-sized stones. <laughs> no, and the oldest evidence of rune writing in Sweden have been dated to the century 200 CE. Uh, and they're not on big stuff like stones. On the contrary, they're written on small items like a buckle and a tip of a spear. Uh, there were some rune stones erected this early, but most writings were on these smaller objects. Early rune alphabet is also slightly different from that which was used during the Viking Age. The alphabet is similar to the one used around the Mediterranean at the time, but the link between the early rune alphabet and other alphabets used in other places at the time is Still something that's debated and researched. Yeah, it's quite complicated Mm. from someone who knows nothing about it. No. But there's also no writing on paper or anything like that, or even on wax tablets like the Romans would have done. No, no, no. In in Scandinavia, it was hard, literally. There is nothing as sophisticated as paper or papyrus and the tablets of the Romans. Rune writing is something that's carved into things rather than written down it's we're talking about carving into objects and like stones or buckles rather than writing anything down all very interesting and we'll yeah definitely try and put some photos up on social media so Mm -hmm. you can see what these things look like yeah i think it's time to introduce two names that will crop up again and again from now on the svear and the jötar Now, as we've said time and time again, there is no Sweden yet, no unified political entity and no identity among the people as Swedes in Sweden yet. Yeah, and it will be well into the Middle Ages before we see Sweden form as something similar to what we'd call a country today. And it only gets its current shape in terms of a actual borders now in the early 1800s so all this stuff is really transient yeah but what we do see during the iron age in sweden during the first centuries ce are two groups two communities of people if you will called svear and Jelta. some of what we know of them borders again on the mythical like we said we'll have a special episode about that the crossing point between myth and and factual history. But broadly speaking, the Sveyar inhabited the area around Lake Melloren and modern-day Stockholm, so they were the ones in charge of all that trade and production and all that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff. And the Yerta lived further south and a bit more to the west, so pushing towards modern-day Norway and the west coast of Sweden. We're now also talking about the middle bit of southern and central Sweden, the very, very south I've been talking about, Skorna and Blekinge, they are much more closely connected to Denmark and would remain so for centuries. So this is almost really when we'll say goodbye to these regions in terms of history of Sweden, because 
in the Viking times especially, they're, they are the Danish mm. Vikings. And so we won't really be talking about these no, places much no. more until another thousand years later. A, so bye, Scorner. Bye I, to my native land who will now for hundreds of years be closely connected and later on a part of Denmark and not rejoin Sweden until uh, the 1600s. And you've got the really far north of Sweden and well, almost now, what we would call now, the top half, in the whole half of the country, which is basically not really explored and certainly not um, inhabited to any great extent. There would have been some, certainly some people yeah, living up there. Yeah, definitely on but the not, coast. But they wouldn't have really been connected to these like sort of tribal groupings yeah. of people and part of a political system. So back to the Svear and Jöta. Yeah. Some people attribute the name Sweden to the Svear or the Suonis that Tacitus talked about in his text because I think it is easy to see, oh, look, they look and sound yeah. a bit similar, so let's just assume that that is the thing. And old historians used to believe that Sweden is simply the continuation of the kingdom of the Svear because... They emerge victorious from wars and negotiations with other groups. But as we'll see in the next however many episodes, the formation of Sweden isn't really that easy. Um, and it's kind of like the go-to. How did Sweden form? Oh, it was these guys. But it's not really probably the best way of talking about it. And nor is it likely that the name Sweden or Sveria in Swedish has much to do with the Sveria either. Mm. And Modern scholars think that it's possibly more likely to come from the ancient Norse word, which meant ours or belonging to us. So Sveirika, which Sweden is known formally, would simply mean our land or land of ours. Yeah. So similarly, some historians believed, and there might still be those who do, that the Jöta are the original Goths. And now I mean the historical Germanic people, not the teenagers that like to wear a lot of eye makeup. Not just teenagers. No, nope, no, nope, true. The, the the gothic subculture is is not limited by age, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the historical people, goths. In general, it's quite murky what's known about Jöthar and much of what was taken as facts for previous generations of historians is being questioned today. Maybe the people of southern and western Sweden, the area that's usually attributed to being where the Göta lived, uh, they were not one unified people, but rather had separate kings and chiefs. Yeah, it's really murky. And some historians, especially as we said, these the older historians, also say that the Herulai or the Urulai were a group of barbarians during the Roman period, which started in Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. And that may be the case, um, but there's so much debate about this and a lot of guesswork in the sources and assumptions made and in modern sources, early medieval sources and sources from the time. So yeah. there's, we're really, really treading the area between history and myth now. And it's talking about something that modern historians are changing their opinions of all the time. So I think it's good enough for now just yeah. to think that the Svea and Jöta are names of people who were probably in Sweden and probably started doing stuff in this period, but we're not we're not going to give our official stamp of approval no. to say it's one hundred percent true. It's it's just two two names that will come up when you when you study Swedish history this period and it's it's good to know a little bit about them. Svea and Jöta. And so now as we finish sort of our roundup of the Germanic Iron Age, um, it's time to look at something that is a little bit more physical and substantial than the um, sort of general theories around the Svea and Jörta, and that's a place called Alastena. Yeah, the Alastena, in, in English it would be Alla Stones. Uh, Stena is the Swedish word for stone. And and it's quite a personal place for us, as it's probably my favourite place to go and visit in the south of Sweden when it comes to this sort of period of history. And it's a stone ship, or a kind of henge, and it's actually our cover photo on Twitter and Facebook, if you're there to look at it. A photo that I took myself. Yeah. Um, 
we should perhaps give it some context in that I, I grew up not uh, far from where Olestea now is. So when we go to see my parents, who still live in, in the area, we are, it's quite a, quite a close outing to do. Yeah, and you've even been a tour guide there. I have. So you have professional knowledge. One of my many, many summer jobs uh, I had in my early 20s was as a tour guide at Ole Stenar, uh, Sweden's largest and best preserved stone ship. So maybe and we should explain a bit what, what a stone ship is, actually. Yeah, so it's a bit like Stonehenge in the sense that it's a load of stones arranged in a shape, this time being a ship shape rather than a circle or a ring like Stonehenge. And Arlestein is really big, as we said, it's the biggest one in Sweden. And that's because it's made of 59 stones and each of them weigh about five tons each. So they're huge. And the overall shape is around 67 meters long and 19 meters wide. So it's a big ship for sure. And the carbon-14 dating system says that the ship dates from around 500 to 100 CE. Mm -hmm. So it's either in this period of the Germanic Iron Age or just pushing into the Vikings. The best estimate in terms of the actual date when it's from is probably roughly 600 CE. And it's a much disputed uh, stone ship, perhaps because archaeological digs in the area hasn't discovered much. It's not been able to clarify what it was. And that's because the site itself in general has been used for farming. If you go there, you will see cows wandering in and out of the stones. It's not boarded off or separated by barriers or anything. Cows live there too. And the whole area was really heavily fortified during the Second World War. Even though Sweden wasn't invaded, they were definitely prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's radar sites, I think, yeah. that was literally about 10 meters away, which is quite amazing, really. And the whole of part of this Swedish coast is covered in bunkers and defense systems that are still there today. So that's another reason to go and visit, perhaps. And in about uh, 200 episodes time, we'll uh, perhaps do a special episode on the fortification of Swedish South Coast. Uh, but uh, anyway, the the stones have also changed and been moved around because, yeah, this was this farmland that, that people used. Uh, but it still looks like a ship. Yeah, a ship. definitely. It has been restored. And judging by other stone ships, though, this has something to do with burials. Either people were buried at the site or burials were held there. Uh, the ship was a symbol of the journey to the other side for much of ancient Norse history. So that's the significance of these stone ships, because Olestena, whilst it's very big and very cool, it's not unique. You find these stone ships actually across Scandinavia, into northern Germany, and in the Baltic states. Yeah, and I know we mentioned in the last episode that there are hundreds and hundreds just on the island of Gotland. Mm. So they're certainly a Swedish thing, but taken into context of a, a wider European idea. And I think, like all of these places, there is so much that is up for debate and discussion a bit like throwback to i think one of the first episodes where we talked about the temples on malta yeah. yeah anybody's guess really um you can certainly judge and use evidence to decide what you think is most likely but it's also uh, what is it <laughs> what is the right idea at all is there now there has certainly been another very vocal but not scientifically proven theory that uh, the stone ship is actually a sundial or a sun calendar uh, because of how the sun shines on the formation of stones at certain points. So that's a vocal, but I should stress, not scientifically proven theory. Well, the main man behind this theory is very dedicated to his theory because when you go to the site, there's um, you know, you get these information boards which uh, which tell you the information about the site, and there's the one from the Swedish 
heritage society or the Swedish government saying, Ola Steiner was this, blah, 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 blah. And the man who loves this theory has gone and put up his own board right next to it saying, don't believe this, this is the truth and has his own information there. So good on him. Well, uh, maybe. I, I don't know. I think the lesson here is, is really that we need nuance and uh, we need a nice friendly debate uh, in history. Debate is good, but it should be uh, conducted in a friendly and polite, uh, polite way. It's important to not be too harsh. Exactly. And going back very, very briefly to the temples on Malta, I think their museum there is perhaps the best one at this kind of thing, because when you go in to look at these temples, there's sort of like a timeline of the history of thought about the temples. So it goes in 850, this archaeologist thought this. In 890, this archaeologist then thought this. And all throughout history, and at the end, it ends with, some people think it's this now, but who really knows? Any one of these people could be right. And I thought that was really clever and grown up of a museum to say that we don't, we're not giving you the answers. We're giving you what these some people think and yeah. just, yeah, take it from there, which is quite good, I think. Yeah, indeed. So nuance is is key. And regardless of what Olesteyna was and the history of it, I must say it's a beautiful place. It's one of my favourite places in the world, probably. It's so peaceful. It's often quite windy, so you kind of feel the force of, of nature up there and you get an amazing view out over the Baltic Sea. Yeah, because I think that's something we didn't actually mention at the start. It is only about 50 metres from the sea. Yeah. So it's right there, which is another reason why, you know, the ship related ideas about the site have come into prominence, because not only does it look like a ship, but it's right by the sea. If you want to go and visit it, it's located about 10 kilometres east of the town Ystad on the Swedish south coast. Not that far from Malmö and Copenhagen on the Danish side. And as I said, it's, it's at a height on the Kjoseberga ridge in the area of uh, Hammarsbackar. So it's very hilly, uh, very beautiful. Area. But it's but it's free. There's no um, barriers or anything mm -hmm. to stop you getting in. It's just in a field with the cows. So you can just turn <laughs> up whenever you like. We've mentioned the cows twice now. The cows are there uh, just to grass the land. No, they're the, gu the guardians. And they're the guardians of, of the stones, but they're also like basically really nice uh, lawnmowers. Yeah, that's quite. They, I would like cows as a lawnmower. Yeah. Perhaps not for the poop though. No. Oh, right. I don't. I don't remember having to avoid the poop. No. Around Alastaina, perhaps there's some sort of Viking spirit who comes up and sweeps away the poop every now and then, so tourists don't step in it. I don't know. Well, go visit, but uh, keep an eye out for the cow, uh, for the cow dung. And on that note, shall we uh, round off today's episode? Yeah, I think we're ever so uh, quickly approaching the Viking Age, but I think we're going to have a sort of gap episode to, to talk about what we need to be careful of when we reach the viking age in terms of history and accuracy and myths and the sagas yeah. and sort of a bit of a introduction to the viking age episode before we get into real hardcore yeah. content as we've already noticed this it is really important to not come down too heavily on a fact in uh, this uh, in this period or well, arguably maybe throughout history, but in the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and into the Viking Age in particular, there is so much intersection of myth and fact and history that we wanted to dedicate an entire episode to that. And then we will dive fully into what Sweden is perhaps most famous for. I don't know. It feels like mo our most famous era of history is the Vikings. Yeah, and despite all of what we have said about being careful of the history, it is going to be the first time where we actually have real dates for events, not just 
at some point in these 500 years, this might have happened. We will now reach the time where we can say in 789, this happened and all that kind of stuff. So that is exciting. Yeah. Uh, but until then, uh, please uh, leave a review on whatever platform you're listening to us. Uh, that means a huge amount to us. So thank you for the reviews we've already had and please uh, keep leaving them. And... and yeah, just keep interacting with us on social media and all of that if you wish. And if not, we'll see you next time. Indeed. Take care. Bye. Hey, doll.